Hi, welcome everybody. As we're letting people come in, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat? Um, we'd love to hear what your organization is that you're with. And if you're with Thrive or SVCN or even better both. Welcome everyone. Nice to see you. Please let us know if you're with Thrive or a member of Thrive or a member of SVCN or a member of both. Excellent. I like it when people are proud Thrive members. It's even better. I'm feeling very competitive right now. <laughs> Is anyone a proud SVCN member, please? We need to make them happy too. Great. <laughs> okay. My name is Petra Sultan, and I want to welcome all of you um, to HR in the new normal. I'm sure that we are all feeling excited that things are changing and nervous and full of questions. And so we decided that it would be a good idea to talk about it. Um, so first I wanna just introduce Thrive briefly and then um, Dana will introduce SVCN and then we'll introduce our speaker. So again, my name is Petra Sultan. I am the Director of Advocacy and Education for Thrive for the Alliance for Nonprofits for San Mateo County. And we do a lot of things, but our general themes are policy and advocacy capacity building for nonprofits and cross-sector collaboration. We do this in many different ways. This is a good example of both uh, capacity building and cross-sector collaboration as the, uh, our speaker is from the, uh, the private sector, as we like to say. So with that, I want to um, turn it over to Dana, who's going to introduce SVCN, and then I will introduce the speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome and thanks for joining. My name is Dana L. Neal. I'm SVCN's Learning and Member Engagement Manager. SVCN unifies and strengthens the voice of local communities serving nonprofits in Santa Clara County so they can become more effective advocates for their organizations and communities. Our training program focuses on organizational effectiveness and capacity building, um, as well as collective impact um, and trying to encourage collaboration across uh, the sector. We advocate at the city, county, and state level on behalf of nonprofits on policies that affect the sector and advocate for policies that our nonprofit community identify as critical to creating equitable and thriving communities and furthering racial justice. Our nonprofit membership is 160 strong. You can learn more about us on our website and become a member today at svcn.org. Thank you. And I do want to emphasize for we are both membership based organizations. If you're not members, we would love for you to become members. If you're not on our mailing lists, you should be on our mailing lists because both of us host sometimes jointly, sometimes apart. Um, lots of great events, both for around education, around advocacy um, and around strengthening our nonprofit community. So again, thank you very much for being here. Um, our speaker today, it comes to us from um, we actually had changed up speakers in the last minute, but uh, Barbara Miller is a partner at Mar Morgan Lewis and Brockius LLP, and she handles complex employment litigation for a wide range of clients. And she is going to has been doing a lot of these lately because there is a lot of, um, like I said before, questions. And uh, she's going to do a presentation. But we really want to encourage you to ask questions and to make this a conversation as you need. So with that, I will turn it over to Barbara. Hi, so um, can you all hear me OK? I just want to make sure that my audio is working. OK, good. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about transitioning back to the office. And this tends to be a better presentation or more useful when uh, you all uh, talk, you know, ask questions and talk among yourselves and share your own experiences. 
Um, I will, uh, having done a lot of these, I think that folks find it most valuable to hear from others in terms of what they're doing and the types of pro uh, problems that they're dealing with. You know, I can raise the topics and answer the legal questions, but f please feel free to chime in to talk about what your experience has been and ask the questions that you have, because that will likely make this session most useful for all of you. So what I'm going to first try to do is share my screen here. And I know uh, we can make these slides available to you. There is a lot of information on them. Um, let's see here. Let's see if I can. Uh, I'm going to try to. So if you can, you all see that uh, pretty well. So the first topic that we're going to talk about is uh, vaccine issues. So there are, at least in the private sector where I deal a lot, a lot of time lately has been spent on bringing folks back to work. Are you going to require vaccinations? Are you not going to require vaccinations? Are you going to um, have collect vaccination information? Are you going to, what are you going to do with masks if you uh, are requesting vaccination information? So all of those questions are coming up a lot uh, with the employers who we deal with. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is there is neither federal nor state law on that, that is restricting what you can and can't do. So nobody is requiring that employers yet, as of now, no one is requiring that employers make their employees get vaccines. But the flip side is also true. Nobody is saying that you cannot require your employees to get vaccines. So this kind of leaves employers in this uh, limbo between where they get to choose. You can decide that you want to mandate vaccines. You can decide you don't want to mandate vaccines. You can decide, you know, you have a lot of power to figure out how you're going to handle the vaccination situation. Now, so let's talk about each side. So some employers, uh, particularly those that interact with children or elderly folks or other vulnerable populations really want to uh, force employees to be vaccinated. Right now, you can. Uh, right now, both nothing in either California law or federal law prohibits you from requiring employees to be vaccinated. The only caveats on that are that you have to accommodate disabilities. So you have to have an accommodation process for folks who cannot get vaccines for legitimate medical reasons. And you have to accommodate sincerely held religious beliefs uh, where people for sincerely held, uh, sincerely held religious belief reasons uh, cannot or you know, cannot get vaccinated. But, but with those caveats and with, accommodation in place for religious and uh, medical disabilities, you can require employees to get vaccinated. Um, so I thought I'd stop there. And, and then one, one other thing is because you all are in Santa Clara County, um, Santa Clara County is requiring, and, and you all probably may know this all the, already, but Santa Clara County is requiring um, employers to collect the data on which of their employees are vaccinated, you know, who, who is vaccinated and who is not in Santa Clara County. So that is something that's unique to Santa Clara County right now, but it is something that with folks who are employed within Santa Clara County, you do need to have a process in place to collect the information about who is and who is not vaccinated. Um, so let me stop there for a minute and uh, answer any questions that you might have about mandating vaccines. Nope. Okay. There was one question in the chat. Oh, let me open the chat. Okay. I have Which too many things question? going. 
<laughs> that's okay, which was just about San Mateo County, but I think that you answered that, that only Santa Clara County is it's required. Santa Clara County. Yeah, it's only Santa Clara County right now. Okay. At least as of yesterday, whether that changed today, I don't know, but as of yesterday, it was Santa Clara County. And I am not seeing how I do both the, oh wait, there, chat, let's see. I can get you the questions if you prefer. I got it, I got it, I figured it out. So the question is how do you collect the information if you're not requiring employees to get vaccines? So our, I'll give you an example. Our law firm, because I was, I was working with this, we're actually, uh, we actually are in Santa Clara County. We're off, there's some other jurisdictions in other parts of the country that also require this information. So what we have done is we collected, you know, we created an electronic form that we just emailed out to all our employees and said, you know, tell us whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. It's just a checkbox. Are you vaccinated? Are you not vaccinated? And we actually um, had it, you know, we have to follow up every two weeks because people's vaccination status can change because the vaccination status is, have are you two weeks out from your second dose? Um, and then we asked them to upload pictures of their vaccination card. Now, I don't know that that second part is necessarily required because we're asking them to attest that what they're, that they, the information that the employees are providing is true and correct. Um, but that, that's what we're doing. Uh, you could probably do it by email, but then you're going to have to keep all those emails. You know, you're going to have to send it out to employees and say, you know, respond or vote or do something with your vaccination status, but then you need to keep track of um, the information so that you have it. Uh, the next question is, could you discuss FDA approval of COVID-19 vaccine and how that might impact? So, yes, um, there are the, the, and I think that question, if I'm not mistaken, is getting to the idea that the vaccine is right now only uh, approved on a, um, uh, on a expedited basis, it is not quote approved pursuant to the FDA's uh, regular regulatory process. It's an emergency approval that exists. There are a couple lawsuits that have been pending that say, well, because the emergency use authorization has voluntariness as an element of that authorization, employers can't require it. Um, those lawsuits don't appear to be going anywhere. They, that, that's something that relates to the approval, you know, whether somebody, you as an employer can't force a person to get a vaccine. All you can do is force them to get a vaccine to do their job. And the authorization relates to whether, you know, somebody can get pulled into a, you know, be forced to take the vaccine for public health purposes. And, and that's, the, the, those lawsuits don't appear to have legs so far. Um, so that is, so somebody sent around the form they're using for the vaccination in Santa Clara County. So that's really helpful. Um, the, the next question on the Santa Clara County thing, are there guidelines for volunteers? Um, I don't believe, okay, so the Santa Clara guidelines are, I believe, for employees, um, not for volunteers who are not employees. So that's one question. Could you then require your volunteers to get vaccinated? So for example, um, if you have volunteers that are volunteering at schools or volunteering with children or volunteering with a vulnerable population. Can you say, you know, to volunteer, to come and volunteer and provide this, we need you vaccinated? The answer is yes. Um, you can do that if you want to. It's just like, you know, a, a retail uh, folks could, if they want to, say, you can't come into my store unless you're vaccinated. Nobody's doing that, but they could do it. Um, the next That's question. Correct. 
Um, Go ahead. Volunteers are covered under the Santa Clara County yep. order. Okay. Okay. Then I thanks. I appreciate that. Sorry, just can't nope. let misinformation continue. That's very, very, very helpful <laughs> because I don't haven't looked at I haven't looked at uh, the volunteers as as opposed to employees. So that's very helpful. Um, so that would include all the volunteers on your board of directors. Well, it's volunteers that are working on site. So I don't know if the board of directors would actually be going to the business, probably not right now. So you might not need to do the board of directors. Okay, then we have a question. Can vaccine status affect employee status after June? I, uh, I'm not sure I understand what that question means. So if somebody could um, kind of communicate what that question, what do you mean by employee status? Uh, yeah, I wasn't really a, a great at wording the, the question, but I was, I was just curious because um, I know uh, as you were saying in the beginning that it's not federally prohibited, but it's also not federally mandated um, currently. But I was wondering because um, there is the possibility that after June, the restrictions are gonna loosen more. Uh, if there was a possibility that there would become a federal mandate for employees to uh, be vaccinated. I sincerely doubt that, that it, you know, anything could happen, but the politics at the federal level right now, I think would make it almost impossible to get the necessary majority in the Senate to cause that to happen. Okay, just so you know, the reason why um, you know, you have a the ADA and applicable state law that prohibit employers from inquiring um, into health issues do not prevent you from asking employees about whether they've been vaccinated or not. The reason or one of the rationale is that an unvaccinated employee could provide a direct threat to other employees. And so therefore, that whole ADA and um, California disability regimen doesn't apply to asking employees about their vaccination status. It does though, you can't start asking employees why they're not getting vaccinated because that can start to get into impermissible health inquiries. So while you can say, hey, you know, I need to know your vaccination status. Are you two weeks out from a second dose? You can collect that information and keep it. What you cannot do then is follow up and say, well, why aren't you vaccinated? What are, you know, what is the impediment? Why are you feeling like you shouldn't get vaccinated? Because that can start to get into soliciting private health information that you probably don't want to do. So asking people if they're vaccinated is fine. Asking why they're not getting vaccinated um, starts to intrude into some private, into some areas where you could potentially have some risk. Um, I have a lot of employers who don't care. They, they feel very strongly that everybody should be vaccinated. And so they are, they are um, at a high level, they have some, you know, some of them have some leaders who are going employee by employee and saying what, what's happening with you and why aren't, what's your resistance to vaccination? Um, but that is a risky, that is a risky behavior. Okay, I wanted, you know, just to talk about some practical considerations uh, regarding mandating vaccines and kind of some of the things that we're hearing from employers about, you know, pros and cons of requiring vaccines, especially as the vaccine became more available. You know, until very recently, it was hard to require vaccines of all employees because they weren't, it was hard to get them. It was hard to say, you know, you should be fully vaccinated right now because it was hard to get it. That is going away. You know, in California right now, anyone who wants to get vaccinated, a vaccination appointment for the most part can get them. Um, 
So that was the primary reason from a practical perspective. The other is this issue with the full approval uh, of the vaccine from the FDA as opposed to the emergency authorization. Um, that it makes a difference to some people and some people are waiting to see it, uh, waiting for the actual um, full FDA approval, not just the emergency authorization. Um, from a implementation perspective, if you're going to mandate vaccines, you need to have an accommodation process in place. You know, so you need to think beforehand about accommodating folks who cannot get vaccinated for, for either religious or disability issues and how you're gonna handle that. There's kind of two thought process in that way. So you have jobs that people can do from home, can do remotely. The accommodation for those folks is usually continue to do your job remotely. The problem for where there's a real problem is jobs that cannot be done remotely and mandating what do you do to accommodate employees whose jobs cannot be performed remotely. And that's a little bit more of an issue. Um, if the job is interacting with people and you are concerned that anybody unvaccinated is a direct threat to other employees or to members of the community, you can say, that I can't accommodate you in a public, you know, in an, in an environment where you must interact with the public or with other employees. You need to look at whether you have some job or some way to enable the person to do a job that doesn't require that interaction um, because there is an accommodation requirement. Um, but that accommodation doesn't mean we're just gonna ignore the direct threat of an unvaccinated person and allow, you know, have you, interacting with vulnerable populations, we don't think that that's right. It's more, fun. can you restructure the job so that they don't have to have those interactions? So are there any questions on that? So when you say that there's a question here, how do you accommodate a religious belief if you don't ask why they won't get vaccinated? That's a really good question. So what you do is when you solicit the information, so if, if you are implementing a mandate, you're saying you have to be vaccinated, we're requiring it as a, a condition of your job. When you do that communication, you do it with a caveat. You say, okay, we are requiring that all employees be vaccinated by August, I'm just gonna make up a date, by August 1st. If you need an accommodation for a sincerely held religious belief or a medical condition, please contact so-and-so. That leaves it up to the employee to request the accommodation. You're not asking the question that for, you know, that solicits the medical information, you're asking, do you need accommodation? And that question is permissible. Asking the question, do you need a accommodation is a permissible question. That question only comes up if you are mandating the vaccine. So the communication would go out and you would say effective, um, whatever, you know, give people some time. You know, it takes about what it takes, you know, a week, three weeks, a week, you know, about six weeks if you haven't been vaccinated yet to get fully vaccinated. So if you were implementing it on June 1st, you'd probably want to get folks, you know, six weeks from June 1st to get vaccinated. So effective July 20th, all employees need to be vaccinated. However, if you need an accommodation of a sincerely held religious belief or a medical disability, please contact so-and-so so we can uh, see if you can be accommodated. Then once you have that, what that accommodation process needs to look like, and we've been dealing with a lot of folks on this, is for religious pur purposes, it has to be a sincerely held religious belief. Sometimes when we've gone, um, some employers have been pretty aggressive about this and they have gone back and said, well, have you received any vaccinations? And the employee will say, 
well, yes, I've received vaccinations, you know, the traditional ones, I just don't want this one. Well, then, you know, and then I've actually had an employer come back and say, okay, well, what is it about this one that from a religious perspective makes it different from the ones you have already had? And at that point, the employee backed off. But um, it, it depends a little bit on how aggressive you want to be. Similarly with medical conditions, there are some medical conditions uh, where people really will get a, a, a physician's, a, you know, to say this person cannot uh, have the vaccine for a legitimate medical reason. Um, if you push a little bit on that, sometimes uh, doctors will change their minds. Sometimes they won't. It just depends a little bit on how aggressive you want to be. So then we have a question. If someone has had COVID recently and they have natural immunity, isn't that as valid as a vaccinated person? Um, so that's not, that's kind of a, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that's a science question. I don't, I, I'm not going to opine on, but I do know that from a employer perspective, um, I'm not sure that you want to be in the business of deciding how effective having COVID is as opposed to the vaccine. I mean, I, you know, and that said, the, the, you know, the mass guidances that aren't, haven't come out yet, you know, uh, we'll get into this if you want to, but California was going to issue an update to its uh, Cal OSHA emergency regulations on how to handle COVID uh, at, in the workplace. Those were supposed to be updated on May 20th. They didn't update them because the CDC came out with a guidance saying, you know, folks who have been vac vaccinated do not need to wear masks around other folks who have been vaccinated. That kind of threw into turmoil the Cal OSHA regs that were going to be uh, published. And so we are right now in California with the old Cal OSHA regs that have been in place, and those will likely stay in place to mid June. So right now in California, still all the employee, all employees have to wear masks. And that is kind of one of the primary reasons um, employers want to mandate vaccines is so that employees at work don't have to wear masks. So that's going to remain in place for a little bit longer. Don't need to come down here. Um, a, a little bit of information about practical consideration. Uh, you all have probably thought about the practical considerations of mandating vaccines. Uh, there is an impact on employees. Employees can get pretty emotional about uh, vaccines and vaccine policies. Some employers just want to avoid that whole kind of political mess and not get into the mandating vaccines, but just merely encouraging them. Um, here's, here's one, uh, mandating vaccines for remote workers. We have had some uh, employers who want to ma mandate vaccines, not just for employees who interact with other employees or who interact with the public, but for employees who are working remotely. Um, that becomes a little bit more challenging because that direct threat component doesn't exist. So it's not clear that you can mandate vaccines for folks whose job is to work remotely. Any questions on that? Um, we talked a little bit about how do you accommodate unvaccinated employees. Um, so you can, if the job requires that the employee interact with other employees or interact with the public, you can say that job that interacts those duties, the interacting with the public or other employees, if those are essential job functions, they cannot be accommodated by somebody who's not vaccinated. But you do have to look at, is there a job available that this employee could do that does not require that they 
you know, interact in person with other employees or interact with the public. Because you have to look around and say, is there any job that we have that this employee can do? Or can we restructure the job so that the employee can do it safely? Can we isolate the employee? Can we provide the employee with protective equipment, you know, N95s, other, other um, accommodations that would enable the employee to do their job safely. And if you look at, so my husband actually has, uh, is doing a lot of this at a hospital and they have, in, and you, uh, this fascinates me, they have only about 82% compliance with vaccination at the hospital. So that means they have about 18% of people who are not vaccinated working at the hospital. And they have to make sure that those um, employees are treating patients safely. They have very rigorous protective equipment requirements. They have to be masked. They have to be gowned. They have to wear N95s. They have a whole set of protocols for folks who are not va vaccinated. But it is possible, at least in that setting, to, for, for folks to perform, perform the job safely, even those who are not vaccinated. Um, so you need, to, you need to really look into, it, the accommodation is beyond, does this person interact with the public? It's, can we, what can we do to enable this employee to perform the job safely? Okay. Any any um, questions on accommodation or what the accommodation burden requires? So now the next, can we've talked about this a little bit, but can the employer ask about vaccine status? The answer is yes. And as you all know, in Santa Clara County, the answer is you have to. Um, But you shouldn't, like I said, you should not ask about the individual's health status or their reasons for not getting vaccinated. Um, what you should do is, what I said is, is, you know, if you've asked, they've said, I'm not vaccinated, just let folks know if you need an accommodation, let us know. Here's how you let us know if you need an accommodation. Um, don't get in the business of trying to uh, treat folks who are unvaccinated worse than folks who are vaccinated. That is uh, an opportunity for future lawsuits. So it's just one of those things to try to stay away at from is try to, you have to accommodate the unvaccinated folks if they have a, dis, uh, a reason for not getting vaccinated. Um, and you can just, uh, so let me back up. You can discriminate if the folks don't need an accommodation. You can tell people you have to get vaccinated to work here. But what you can't do is discriminate against folks who cannot get vaccinated because of a religious or uh, disability reason. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Can you require employees to show proof of vaccination? Yes, and you can collect uh, their vaccination cards. Right now, the only real good proof of vaccination, we that's a, another bugaboo in our country, is all we have is those CDC cards. But you can, and, and some health, uh, some providers, you know, um, will, you know, their electronic immunization record will show the COVID vaccination. Uh, you can ask for the proof of vaccination. You can keep it. If you keep it, keep it in a private place that's separate from the employee's personnel file. Or if it's a volunteer, keep it separate. Treat it as private confidential information. Um, disclose it only on a need to know basis. Treat it as uh, very confidential and separate it from other types of information. Okay, so I'm gonna have to defer to others. One of the questions here is I have, I was looking at, the Santa Clara regulations for um, employee purposes. I do not know the answer to for the Santa Clara, do we need to check the vaccination status of all contractors? If uh, somebody knows the answer to that, that would be great. If not, I can uh, look it up and send it to Petra.
I know that a lot of um, the employers that I deal with are requiring um, their contractors to be vaccinated. They're more aggressive with the contractors than they are with their own employees and actually requiring folks who come on their premises as contractors to be vaccinated. Okay, so the next, can we eliminate mask standard social distancing for vaccinated employees? <laughs> this is a really common question. So this is coming up more and more often because of the CDC uh, guidance that said vaccinated people don't have to wear masks around other vaccinated people. Right now in California, the California, like I said before, the Cal OSHA emergency regulation that went into effect in the fall is still in effect. And so employees do have to distance and they do have to wear masks. It doesn't right now matter that the CDC has said otherwise. Right now in California, employees have to wear masks and have to distance when they're uh, with one another. That may change when the Cal OSHA gets around to issuing a new set of regulations, but as a, which, which will likely be in mid-June. Um, but for right now, uh, employees still need to be wearing masks when they're gathering within six feet of each other. Um, and one would hope that new, we anticipate that that new set of regulations will say, if you are gathering with only vaccinated uh, individuals, then nobody needs to wear a mask. But that's going to really um, bring to a head this issue of how are you as the employer going to figure out if your conference only has vaccinated employees? Or how are you going to make sure that if you are having a conference in a conference room with 10 people, all 10 of those people are vaccinated? You know, at that point, you will really be in a situation where you have to know who's vaccinated and who's not, or you'll have to require everybody who comes to work to be vaccinated. Um, a lot of the employers that I'm dealing with are setting up policies that say, if you're coming back to work, you have to be vaccinated unless you need an accommodation and then we'll talk. Um, the reason for that is the employers are anticipating that they want to have workplaces where employees don't have to wear masks. And the only way they're gonna have workplaces where employees don't have to, be, have to wear masks is if they make sure that everybody who comes back is vaccinated. So that, that, those, those two things kind of go hand in hand, uh, the masks and the vaccination. If you aren't gonna figure out who's vaccinated and who's not, you're not gonna be able to get rid of your, vac your mask requirement at work. Um, okay, so any questions on, I'm kind of gonna change topics here. Do employers need to pay for the cost of vaccines? The answer is not right now. Um, and right now they're kind of free anyway, at least in California. So it's not uh, that much of an issue. Um, do employers need to pay for time spent getting vaccinated? California, the answer is yes. California, we have a, there's, there's two, two things going on. Number one, if you are going to require that employees get vaccinated, the DLSC has said that if the employer requires employees to be vaccinated, that is time worked and it needs to be compensated as time worked. The travel to and from the vaccination site, the time at the vaccination site needs to be compensated as time worked if the employee, if you're gonna require vaccinations. If you don't require vaccinations, then employees can take supplemental sick paid sick leave and, and uh, I'll go through over what that is, but they have, there's a supplemental paid sick leave requirement that allows people to take up to 80 hours for COVID related reasons. One of those reasons is to get the vaccine or if they're suffering from, you know, effects of the vaccine, then they get supplemental paid sick leave to pay for that time. Um, 
any questions on getting paid for vaccination time in California? Okay, so most of you have been dealing with the uh, OSHA, the Cal OSHA guidance on how to deal with uh, COVID in the workplace and how to have your workplaces safe. You have to do a plan for how to address COVID in the workplace. Is there anybody on the phone that, that hasn't had to deal with the Cal OSHA regulations and all their requirements, um, or that has any questions about what those existing Cal OSHA requirements are. You know, you have to have a plan, you have to institute controls, you have to clean, you have to have masks, you have to socially distance, you have to train, um, and then you have to have a way, uh, if, if an employee gets COVID, you have to notify the other employees. If you have an outbreak, there's a whole set of uh, regulations that apply. Those all remain in effect. And I could do a whole hour presentation just on those. So I don't want to, but what you do need to be aware of is that there are extensive Cal OSHA regulations on how you create a safe workplace for employees. And those regulations have been in effect for the last, I don't know, six, seven months, uh, since November, I think. And they remain in effect. And the question is, is it okay to open our break rooms again? I mean, you can open break rooms if you comply with all the OSHA requirements. So, you know, you have to comply with the social distancing, you have to have the masks, you have to do the cleaning. All of the regulations that have been in place since November in California are still in place. They will likely go away, but right now, today, they are still in place. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on those. The, uh, if you, I put a lot of them in the slide presentation if you need the Cal the Cal OSHA emergency standard requirements, what you need to do in an outbreak. It's, it, there's a very long list of things you need to do and you need to have someone who's familiar with what to do at least for another month and then they'll change. Um, so here's, here's what happened. On May 7th, they, the Cal OSHA issued a new set of emergency regulations that we're updating for the current circumstance and they were going to, uh, go into effect on May 20th. On May 13th, the CDC came out and said fully vaccinated people don't need to be masked if they're only with fully vaccinated people. The proposed California regulations didn't align with that. So the Cal OSHA, they met on the 20th and said, we've got to align our regulations with the CDC's recommendation, they don't do that right now, so we're not going to do anything. Uh, they're planning theoretically to uh, issue new proposed regulations uh, for comment on May 28th that wouldn't then be adopted for at least two or three, I think it's uh, at least two weeks after that. So I think the earliest anything could be changed is, January, is June 15th in California. Any questions on that or any questions about the temporary, the Cal OSHA temporary standards that have been in effect for the last, I don't know, five or six months. Okay. So what, you know, some of the prior proposed religion uh, re regulations are, are good to know about because they show the direction that Cal OSHA was heading. They were planning to uh, sunset physical distancing on as of July 31st. That may move up. We'll see. Um, they exempted telecommuting employees. They exempt employees uh, wearing respirators or from the definition of close conduct, close contact. Um, they defined face coverings, they defined who was fully vaccinated, they um, required employers to provide exposure notice 
when they know or should know about a COVID-19 case, that means somebody at work who's had COVID and has been within other, with other employees in the prior 48 hours for more than 15 minutes. That's a good definition to keep in mind. A COVID-19 case, it starts with what is a COVID-19 case? It's somebody who has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and the exposed people are people who were within, spent more than 15 minutes with that employee within 48 hours of the onset of symptoms. That's who is an exposed employee in a COVID case. And that kind of defines all the regulation notice requirements. So those were kind of the proposed regulations. We'll see what actually comes up, that this is a pretty rapidly evolving situation and um, the regulations will change significantly. It'll be interesting to see what gets published on May 28th. Um, so wait and see on that. If you're interested on May 28th, the Cal OSHA should update its website with the new set of proposed regulations for returning people to work. Okay, any questions on any of that, the safe, how to create a safe workplace or what to do about employee vaccinations or requiring uh, employee vaccinations? Okay, now I just wanted to touch briefly on the COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. This is a California requirement. Um, it applies, it went into effect on March 29th of 2021, but was retroactive to January 1st of 2021 and sunsets goes away on September 30th of this year. And it's any employer with more than 25 employees and the covered employees are any employee who cannot work or telework for an employer due to a covered reason. And the amount of leave is up to 80 hours and they get paid and there's a really complicated pay formula. Um, in general, it's they get paid their hourly rate, but it's actually their regular rate uh, that they, it, it, and because you're not, you probably don't have this issue. Um, so it's really their hourly rate or their salary unless they get some kind of incentive pay, which probably doesn't apply to any of you. Okay, so what are the reasons people can take this 80 hours of California supplemental leave? This is in addition to sick leave. It's in addition to paid vacation. Um, it's in addition to paid time off. It's an additional 80 hours. And it's in addition to the California sick leave. So y'all know that there's a California sick leave requirement. This is in addition to the California sick leave requirement. And the employee uh, can take this leave if they're unable to work or to telework, work from home, for one of the following reasons. They have to stay at home. They can't. They're subject to a quarantine or isolation or to care for a family member who is subject to a quarantine or isolation period. Um, the employee is getting a vaccine, attending an appointment to receive the vaccine. The employee is having side effects of the vaccine that prevent the employee from being able to work. The employee is having symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis. The employee is caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed or unavailable for reasons related to COVID-19 on the premises. So those are the reasons somebody can take this time off. Um, the big one that I have run into since this was implemented is employees who say that they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 so they can't come to work, but then don't wanna go get tested. So they, they say, and the question comes up, well, if they're saying they have symptoms, but they won't go te get tested, so we know, do I have to let them take this leave time? Um, you know, one, I would argue that the seeking a medical diagnosis means they only get the leave if they agree to go get tested to see if they're sick. Um, but that is that is a situation that a lot of employers are dealing with. And I don't know if, if anybody in the call has had anything along those lines come up or has had any challenges with this paid sick, uh, the supplemental paid sick leave. 
So if an employee goes on vacation and they know they have to quarantine, are they are required to pay them CSPSL? So that's a really good question. Um, have that had that question come up as well? Um, you know, the safe thing to do is, well, I have some employers that are saying you can't do that. You know, you cannot go to somewhere where you have to have be isolated when you come back because of this. I have other employers who are taking this and just are risk adverse. So they're saying, okay, well, if the employee does that, we are gonna let them use their supplemental paid leave. I have others who are saying, you know, this is a voluntary thing and the state couldn't have been intending for us to, you know, have somebody go to Brazil and then get 10 days of, paid, you know, paid leave when they get back because they chose to go to Brazil. I, I'm just making up Brazil, but, but you know, so, something like that. Um, that really depends on the risk tolerance of the employer. Um, because you can see from a wording perspective, it seems to apply, but from a legislative intent perspective, that wouldn't seem to be uh, something that should be covered. Uh, so just so you know, there is a note, a poster that you have to post. Um, you can get it from the DLSC's website. Um, you have to let employees know how much of this California paid supplemental leave they have left on their wage statements. That has been a very significant challenge uh, for a lot of employers to adapt their pay statements quickly to show the amount of paid supplemental sick leave available. Um, I don't know if any of you have had that problem. I have had a lot of employers who have dealt with this requirement by just giving employees access to it, you know, telling them uh, on the pay date, here's where you can uh, check to see how much of this you have available rather than trying to get it printed on the pay statements. Um, some people just put it up on the wall. Some people email it out. Uh, there's different ways that employers are making the amount of California supplemental sick leave available, uh, making that available to employees on designated pay dates if you can't put it on their pay statements. The other thing is employees, if they took um, uh, leave or they took unpaid time off for a qualifying reason prior to this law, they can come back and request pay under this law um, and you have to give it to them. It's just something to be aware of. That very few employees are doing that. It requires that they ask for it. It requires that they come back and say, hey, you know, I was out for three days in January because I thought, you know, I was sick and I thought I might have COVID. And so I went and got tested. It turned out I was negative, but that's the way I was out. Can I get my sick leave for that time? If they do that, you'd have to say yes and give it to them. Um, like I said, it's an addition to other sick, other California sick leave, vacation PTO. Um, and you know, it's just an additional retire uh, entitlement. It'll go out of, it'll go away in September. So any, any questions on California supplemental sick leave? Um, preparing your work so that we've gotten a lot of questions on how to bring people back. Um, if folks who have been gone, who have not been operating or have been operating with very lean staffs and most pe people have been working at home, um, a lot of thoughts about how to bring people back effectively and safely. Um, the first thing is to figure out how to socially distance folks when they come back. Um, to make sure that you have protocols in place to clean, you know, and have enhanced cleaning of, of surfaces and workspaces. Um, 
to think about how to reduce the personal interaction among employees once they're at work. Um, in some places, there we have some employers who are staggering shifts, keep, you know, cohorting employees, you know, keeping employees in cohorts so they work with the same 10 or 20 people. So if one cohort is exposed, the other employees are not. Um, there are a lot of ways that employers are thinking about how do we bring people back in a way that minimizes um, potential for exposure. Um, there are also thoughts about bringing people back in phases, starting with you know folks who want to come back first, folks, folks who are willing to wait to come back. Um, some folks, some places are, some jobs are more critical to be in person than not in person. There's a lot of staggered schedules and thoughts about how to stagger schedules to both implement social distancing in off offices and to reduce the level of uh, personal interaction and to consider opening workspaces only to vaccinated folks. I, I think this is the most common thing I'm seeing is the idea that, well, for now, we're only going to have folks who are vaccinated come back. We, we're, not, we're, we're not in a position where we want to mix vaccinated with unvaccinated people. We think that the safest way to bring people back is to make sure everybody who comes back is vaccinated and we'll delay for another day what we're going to do with unvaccinated folks. Um, so and and that's fine, you know that that there's no problem with doing it that way. Other than some employers just have a, uh, they do not want to treat. There's there's a resistance to treating vaccinated people differently from unvaccinated people, and in those work sites, you have to treat everybody as unvaccinated. Okay. There's some, um, there's a lot of other information in this slide presentation once it's distributed. The one thing that I did wanna point out, one of the areas that we are seeing some litigation is when you're doing wellness checks and temperature screenings and that kind of thing, to make sure that you think about whether that's getting captured as work time that you're paying for. Um, one of the common lawsuits that we're seeing is uh, employees claiming that the minute the minute or couple minutes they spent on wellness checks and health screens should be compensated and wasn't. So think about whether uh, you're making sure that that happens. So I think that that's my hour. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that come up. So I think we're going to um, give you a huge thank you. So we really appreciate it. This is a massive amount of information and I know there's still some questions. So what I would love is um, to let you know, we will absolutely send out the slides. We will send out the recordings. If there's a specific question you want to answer, you can email me or email Dana and we will make sure to get it to, um, to Barbara and try to get that out before we send out our follow-up email. So thank you so much, Barbara. We really appreciate this. It is such a complicated, time right now and any help we can get is appreciated so thank you for taking your time and on behalf of thrive and svcn thank you so much okay thank you bye